Welcome to Cinematic Excrements. You know, it's amazing that I've done almost 90 episodes of this silly little movie review show, and somehow I've never come in contact with the work of Rob Schneider. Hard to believe, isn't it? I actually went through his entire IMDb page just to make sure I wasn't missing anything. This guy has been in over 60 movies, including several alongside his buddy Adam Sandler, who I have encountered on this show more than once, and except for Demolition Man and maybe Muppets in Space, they're almost always critically panned. Yet he's never been the subject of one of my reviews. But I figured it was high time that changed, especially since Mr. Schneider recently found himself in the news when he thought it would be a good idea to explain Martin Luther King to Representative John Lewis a man who actually knew Dr. King. And when people started pointing out that maybe trying to explain Dr. King to a guy who actually marched with him back in the day isn't really the best idea, he went on a hissy fit and complained that he was being silenced. Oh, Lord, help me. The big bad liberals are silencing me. Oh, no. Help, help, I'm being repressed. You know, for someone who has supposedly been silenced, he sure talks a lot. I guess I shouldn't be surprised that Rob can't take criticism well. That's been his MO for over a decade. Back in 2005, when film reviewer Patrick Goldstein had the audacity to say something negative about Deuce Bigelow male gigolo, I know, shocking, right? Mr. Rob Schneider did not take it well. This motherfucker actually took out a full-page ad in multiple publications suggesting Goldstein was not qualified to comment on his movie since he had never won the Pulitzer Prize or any other journalistic award because, quote, they haven't invented a category for best third-rate, unfunny, pompous reporter who's never been acknowledged by his peers. Rob, something tells me you and M. Night Shyamalan would get along great. Ultimately, Roger Ebert came to the defense of his colleague in his review of Deuce Bigelow European Gigolo and pointed out that Goldstein had, in fact, won several awards, including a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Publicist Guild. And while he conceded that Goldstein did not have a Pulitzer under his belt, Mr. Ebert himself did. And he concluded his review with this now infamous statement. Speaking in my official capacity as a Pulitzer Prize winner, Mr. Schneider, your movie sucks. I miss Roger Ebert. Well, I could go on about Schneider's stupidity, but I like to keep my videos under an hour, so let's just move on to his latest terrible movie and the subject of today's review, Norm of the North. If you're wondering how this didn't end up on my bottom 10 movies of 2016, that's because I didn't see it until recently. Had I seen it last year, it probably would have made the list. But I'm not going to redo the list, so don't ask. The history of Norm of the North is a bit complicated. It was produced jointly by Splash Entertainment, their first animated feature film, and Indian animation studio Assemblage, their second. However, the project was originally started by Crest Animation Productions, producers of such box office bombs as The Swan Princess, The King and I, and The Trumpet of the Swan, the latter of which made only about $100,000. Ouch. According to a release to shareholders, Lionsgate partnered with Crest on the production of Norm of the North in 2011, don't ask me why, and anticipated a release by the end of 2012. But Crest went belly up before finishing the film and it was handed over to Splash. The film was eventually released in the January dumping ground of 2016, over three years after its original target for release. Much to the surprise of no one, I'm sure, Norm of the North was a spectacular train wreck. The film was critically panned upon release and currently has a feeble 9% on Rotten Tomatoes and a 21 on Metacritic. But this one guy on IMDb apparently liked it. Soon you will know that movie critics have been fooling you and defaming this masterpiece movie when you see its international success. Yeah, about that. The film only made about $10 million internationally and $17 million in North America. Against an $18 million production budget, that seems like a slight profit, but when you factor in the reported $13 million Lionsgate spent on marketing the film, it's a bona fide box office bomb. Sadly, so is Kubo and the Two Strings. I'm sorry, I'm not letting this go. What the hell, people? Well, I've dragged this out long enough. Let's take a look at Norm of the North. The first thing you'll notice when watching Norm of the North is the animation looks great when compared to Kiara the Brave. But then, the last time I threw up, my vomit-filled toilet looked better than Kiara the Brave. But compared to virtually any other animated movie that came out last year, it's pretty weak. Just look at that water. 
Would you believe Norm of the North came out the same year as Moana? Hell, it'd be sad if it came out the same year as the first Toy Story. And why are the caribou playing cards? And why are there caribou on what appears to be an iceberg? They live on tundra. So do lemmings for that matter. Oh, and speaking of the lemmings, they are the worst. The lemmings are very tiny creatures that speak in gibberish and engage in random physical comedy. Sound familiar? Yeah, they're a pretty shameless ripoff of the minions, which would at least be tolerable if anything they did was actually funny, but they're not at all. Oh look, they're getting electrocuted. Hilarious. Hey, check it out. If you squish them, they pop right back up. That's not going to give kids the wrong idea. Oh good, I was hoping we'd get a fart joke. Fart jokes are my favorite. Oh look, they're peeing. And that's it. And now they're doing it again. Is it funny yet? I would suggest this movie was written by five-year-olds, but that would be an insult to five-year-olds. Anyway, here's an animal that actually should be in this setting, and it's our titular Norm of the North, voiced by Rob Schneider. I can only assume he read the script before he agreed to be a part of this movie, which means he's either bored and in desperate need of something to do, or he's really hard up for cash. But I digress. Norm is a special polar bear. No, not in that way. He's special in that he can apparently talk to humans. Or at least English-speaking humans. Whether he can speak in other human languages is never really made clear. Because that would entail the writers actually thought things through and, well, we know that didn't happen. And who are the parents of the year that let their daughter wander that close to a live polar bear? Anyway, it turns out Norm isn't the only polar bear with this gift, as his grandfather, the king of the polar bears, can also speak human and he assures his grandson he has been given an incredible gift. Oh, and does this image remind you of anything? Look, Norm, everything the light touches is our kingdom. But it's just a big block of ice. Yeah, but if Al Gore is right, pretty soon we won't even have that. Anyway, this little corner of the Arctic gets a lot of tourists for some reason, and the animals apparently put on a song and dance review. I'm sorry, what? Where did they get tuxedos? Where did they get a cannon? What the fuck am I watching? And this is not the only dance number. This movie is loaded with them. And most of them are set to the exact same friggin' song. I guess they had to do something to pad the running time out to 90 minutes. So at some point, Norm's grandpa vanishes. We never actually see this happen. We're just told about it after the fact. And Norm seeks out a seagull named Socrates for advice. Norm! Grab a seat. Be with you in a minute. Just finishing up. Bill Nye, what are you doing here? You have a career. Also, finishing up what? It looks like you're just standing there. Establishing shots, people. Even crappy animated movies for dumb children need them. I guess most of the polar bears are under the impression Norm's grandfather abandoned them, but Socrates suspects foul play, no pun intended. And he leads Norm to his evidence, a model home. <laughs> Wait, what? Humans are moving here to live? Why? Yeah, this is actually the film's premise. Some guy named Mr. Green, voiced by Dr. Ken, who, to be fair, is a bit less annoying than usual, is planning to start building condos in the Arctic. Condos in the Arctic. He even has investors. What idiot would invest in something like this? This is ridiculous. Condos in the Arctic is a ludicrous idea. No, 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 no. Pointing out how ridiculous your premise is does not make it any less ridiculous. You're not getting off that easy. Ridiculous or not, it's happening, and Norm tries to warn his fellow animals about the encroaching humans, but everyone just laughs at him. And the way his father talks to him, it sounds like he knows what's going on, but is trying to cover it up. Why would he do that? Is the king of the polar bears taking a kickback from Mr. Green? This makes no fucking sense! Well, it turns out the humans are filming a commercial at this model home, and the production is led by Mr. Green's head of marketing, Vera, voiced by Heather Graham. And somehow she's getting cell phone reception in the fucking Arctic. So Norm and his lemming pals sabotage the production in an allegedly hilarious sequence. We'll fix the rest in post. Anything can be fixed in post. In one of my movies, I wrote the plot in post. Oh, was it this one? But the sabotaged commercial isn't enough to stop Mr. Green's plan, so Norm decides to hitch a ride to New York and try to stop Mr. Green himself. And it turns out they're holding auditions for a new commercial and need a man who can play a polar bear. How goddamn convenient. And of course, everyone thinks he's a human wearing a polar bear costume.
because the plot just wasn't stupid enough. Mr. Green, meet Norm of the North. Fun fact, Norm never tells Vera his name. How did no one catch that? So after a wacky turn of events involving Mr. Green getting shot in the ass with a tranquilizer dart, oddly enough, another thing Moana did better, Norm becomes a celebrity overnight and takes a job as the official spokesperson for Green Homes. He goes on talk shows, he dances, he shoots commercials, he dances. God, this movie has so many random ass dance numbers. It's kind of like La La Land, if La La Land was a cheap, directionless, festering pile of shit. Mr. Green is hoping Norm shooting his commercial will generate a high enough approval rating so he can convince the Polar Council, whoever the fuck they are, to allow him to build his Arctic condos. But Norm, of course, has no interest in actually promoting Green's plan. Rather, with the help of Vera's daughter Olympia, who of course is the only human in this movie smart enough to realize Norm is actually a polar bear, though for some reason she's not weirded out by the fact that he can talk, He's hoping to use his newfound popularity to save the Arctic and stop green homes. But the thought occurs to me that there's probably a much easier solution to stopping green homes. Don't work for him. I mean, it seems pretty simple to me. The only way for Mr. Green to get his plan approved is for Norm to do his commercial. So don't do his fucking commercial. Arctic safe, problem solved, everybody go home. Oh, but then we wouldn't have a movie. Although... We barely have a movie as is. I cannot stress enough just how lazy this production looks. Everything about this movie appears to have been thrown together as quickly and cheaply as possible with the minimum amount of effort. The animation, the story, the voice acting, the half-assed environmental message, even the dialogue. I tell you, He's just screaming gibberish. Did anyone working on this movie give a damn? Getting back to the story, Norm tries to sabotage the commercial, but his plan is foiled by Mr. Green. Norm of the North supports green homes in the Arctic. Okay, putting aside the fact that that audio sounds obviously edited, Norm never said some of those words. And some of the words he did say were said in places where Mr. Green could not possibly have recorded them. So how did he get the audio? This is stupid! When sabotaging the commercial doesn't work, Norm decides to go after Green's investors. I'm still shocked these people exist, and convince them building homes in the Arctic would be a bad idea. You're a real bear? Uh -huh. Who uh -huh. can speak? Yeah, who would have thought? I don't care how often you point out how ridiculous this is, you're still not getting a pass on this. After pointing out the environmental impact the homes would have, and showing them some video evidence of Green bribing the Polar Council, wait a minute. If he was bribing them, then why was he worried about the approval ratings? Isn't the entire point of bribing someone so you don't have to follow the rules? Or was he just bribing them for funsies? I, it, I, I don't know. Anyway, after Norm shows them the evidence, the investors decide to pull out of Green Homes. Investors pulling out of a deal over ethical and legal concerns? Well, that's got to be the most unrealistic thing about this movie. And this is a movie about a talking polar bear. But Green tells the investors they already signed a contract so they can go fuck themselves. Well, that was entirely pointless. So if Norm wants to stop Green Homes, he'll have to do it himself. So he chases after the trucks that are transporting the condos. Because they're shipping them fully constructed for some reason. And one of the trucks just happens to contain Norm's grandpa, whom Norm bravely rescues. I guess grandpa went missing because he tried to stop Mr. Green himself and has been held prisoner ever since. Though I have no idea why. Seriously, why didn't you just kill him? Long story short, the condos end up on a boat and the bears send them down to Davy Jones' locker, which wasn't terribly difficult since the ship was caught in a storm. In fact, they probably would have sunk without the bears' interference, but whatever. The Arctic is saved and Green is ruined. And I just wasted 90 minutes of my life that I will never get back. Norm of the North is an absolute mess from start to finish. No part of this movie works. Not one. Yet somehow, not one Razzie nomination. And they even extended each category this year from five nominations to six. Surely they could have found room for Norm in there somewhere. I can only assume this movie was not nominated because the members of the Golden Raspberry Foundation instinctively blocked out all memory of its existence. Or maybe they've just lost their damn minds. It would explain how Naomi Watts got a nomination. Seriously, what were they thinking? I am amazed this movie got a theatrical release. Everything about Norm of the North screams direct-to-DVD. 
Hell, I'm amazed it got released at all. I know there's only so much they can do with the low budget and abruptly changing production companies probably didn't help either, but I've seen plenty of low budget movies that still had goddamn effort. With Norm, I see no evidence of effort anywhere. I'm not sure the people who made this movie actually wanted to. Were they working under duress? Were they just in it to make a quick buck? I don't know. What I do know is the end result of their lack of effort is god-awful and should be avoided at all cost. Well, we're starting off 2017 on a high note, aren't we? And next time, it's not gonna get much better, because we're returning to the wonderful world of superheroes. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it. tell you about writing poetry. I know, I know. Leave the poetry to the panda bears. What does that even mean?